What's up, rock stars? This is Laura with STP, and the December test is coming up quick. So I have another predictions video for you guys. I'm really excited. I'm gonna give you my top 10 predictions. Some are English, some are math to help you get ready for this test. Now, if you are studying last minute, go ahead and type cram in the comments below. Also type what you think you're gonna get on this next test. I think it'll be really fun to compare with your actual score later. Let's see how close your prediction was. Now, before I get into the 10 problems, this video is brought to you by Preply, the digital SAT daily practice app that's available in the App Store and in Google Play. So if you have a really busy schedule, but you find yourself on your phone constantly, Preply is the way to go. You can squeeze in 10 to 15 minutes of daily SAT practice. So, you know, sometimes it's hard, guys. Like, we can't do a full test every day. So just do what you can. There's a lot of unique, exclusive questions, over a 1,000 in the app in both English and math. So if you're running out of prep materials, I know you've probably done the Blue Book test three or four times already. Download properly today and get that last minute prep in before your test. I will link it up here right now. All right, my first prediction is a trending topic now from what I've heard from other students. They are asking about consecutive odd integers. So I think that this is gonna show up on the December SAT. What's interesting about this concept is it is an OG paper test concept from like years ago. So let's take a look at this question together. It says, in a set of four consecutive odd integers where the integers are ordered from least to greatest, the first integer is represented by X. The product of 15 and the third odd integer in the set is at most the value of 50 less than the sum of the first and fourth odd integers in the set. What is the greatest possible value of x? Well, first off, if we're talking about consecutive odd integers, remember, odd integers skip one every time. So it goes 3, 5, 7. So when you set it up, if the first integer is x, the next integer has to be x plus 2. Okay, then the next one after that is going to be x plus 4, and then the next one after that is going to be x plus 6. So here's our first, here's our second number, here's our third number, here's our fourth number. Now what they're doing here is they're basically challenging you to take this English phrase and translate it into an equation. This is a skill that you need throughout the SAT math. So let's do that. It says the product of 15 and the third odd integer in the set. So 15, now the third one's x plus 4, so 15 times x plus 4, is at most, so that means it's going to be less than or equal to the value of 50 less than the sum of the first and fourth odd integers in the set. So the first integer is x, the fourth is x plus 6, and then it's going to be 50 less than that. Be careful. Students, when they see a less than statement, they like put the number in the front, but it's 50 less than all that. So you subtract it from the end. So be very careful with that. Now it's just simple, you know, um, solving, like just going through PEMDAS and taking care of all your steps. So we've got 2x minus 44, and then I'm going to take 60 away. So now I have, um, and I'll take 2x away, actually. So I have 13x is less than or equal to negative 104. We'll divide by 13. Let's see what we get. And I would definitely recommend you bring your calculator with you to the test. Desmos is great for some things, but quick computations are better on the calculator. Okay, so x is less than or equal to negative 8. Now here's the thing. They said um, x is odd. So when they're asking for the greatest possible value of x, be careful, you can't tell them negative eight. That's not an odd number. So we're going literally from negative eight down. So the greatest odd number after negative eight is gonna be negative nine. So that's the answer you're gonna wanna fill in. All right, my second prediction that I've noticed is trending is ing verb. So you might need to pick a verb that ends in ing, and here's a case for when you would do that. It says, author Madeline L'Engle, blank to create a suspenseful tone that draws the reader in, begins her novel A Wrinkle in Time. Now, here's the thing. We have a subject here. It's about this author. And the verb, guys, is way down here. 
What that means is when you see stuff in between two commas, like we have a comma here and a comma here, all this that I'm highlighting orange is what's called a non-essential clause. So a non-essential clause means that um, it's not necessary for the sentence to make sense. And so you don't want to pick a verb tense that will not make it non-essential and that's gonna compete with the verb begins. So the best thing to do to keep something non-essential is to pick an ing verb looking. When I read it out loud, you'll be able to tell that it sounds great. So author Madeline L'Angle, looking to create a suspenseful tone that draws the reader in, begins her novel A Wrinkle in Time. As you can see, it works great. All right, if you're finding this video helpful so far and you haven't yet, make sure to smash the subscribe button and notification bell below so you don't miss out on future content for me to help you master the SAT. All right, my third prediction deals with getting a tricky percentage problem. What I want you guys to do is be mindful if the problem says it's increasing or it's just um, a percentage of something. Okay, so like, let me demonstrate. It says increasing a value X by 400% yields 60. Okay, setting this up properly is everything. We start with a value X then we're increasing it by 400%. So I'm taking X, I'm adding 400% of X to X, then that equals 60, okay? Too many students set it up as 4X equals 60, and then they end up getting it wrong. If it said 400% um, of X is 60, then you're gonna write 4X equals 60. But because of that word increasing, you have to add the 400% onto the X, if that makes sense. So then you end up basically getting 5X equals 60, so X is gonna be 12. All right, guys, my fourth prediction is that you're gonna have a trig problem on this test. So make sure you understand so katoa, right? Sine is opposite or hypotenuse. Uh, cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. And always draw a picture. So when they say in triangle PQR, PQ is a hypotenuse. So I'm going to make that happen right now. PQ, R is going to be the right angle. And then it says the length of QR is 54. So I'm going to write that in. And they want to know what is the length of PQ. Now, when you look at all the answer choices, it looks like the reference angle is Q. So we're gonna go from this reference angle right here, Q. So that means we essentially have um, an adjacent and a hypotenuse, that's cosine. So I already know I'm gonna get rid of B and D, and then I just have to set it up properly. So I'm gonna say the cosine of Q equals 54 over X. We don't know the hypotenuse. When you solve for X, you multiply by X on both sides. So now you have X cosine Q equals 54, then divide by cosine Q. And there you have it. Your hypotenuse is 54 over cosine Q, which is C. All right, my next prediction, prediction number five, deals with a regression problem. I think you're going to have one of these on your test. Um, this is something that has been definitely trending lately and it makes it so much easier to solve. So a key thing or an indicator that you can do a regression is if they give you a table or at least two points on the function, okay? Then another indicator that you can do a regression is that they provide you with an equation. Basically, with a regression, you put it in Desmos, and Desmos does all the heavy lifting for you. So let me demonstrate. So first, I'm going to start by putting the values into a table. You can actually type the word table, and it will come right up, which is kind of cool. So we had negative 27, negative 9, 0, 21, 5. Next, on the next line, I'm going to type in the equation that they provided for me. A couple of things. Instead of X and Y, you're going to use X1 and Y1, so it will pull from the table. The other thing is you can't use an equal sign. You have to use a tilde. It's just part of how the program works, so just trust me on that. Also, function notation doesn't work. So when we go back to the problem, see how there's an F of X on top? We can't type in F of X. Desmos is going to get confused, but they said F is a linear function. So we're basically going to retype this in as y1 tilde, because g of x is y, and then we're going to put the equation 
for a line on the top, which is MX plus B. So that's how we're gonna enter it. And I'm gonna put that top, the numerator in parentheses. Okay, so as you can see, they've given us the graph and they've also given us our parameters. So if you look at this, they said the slope of the line is four and the y-intercept of the line is 36. So when they say, what is the y-intercept of the line? Because remember, f of x is the line. They don't want the y-intercept of g of x. So don't look at the graph because that's g of x. They just want the y-intercept of the line. B was 36 according to Desmos and you're done. All right, my next prediction is that you will have a grammar question with a dash separating a non-essential clause with another dash. So essentially, these are pretty easy. If you see a dash in the sentence, gravitate towards the one with the dash and check to see if it's a non-essential clause. They go on to list South American territories specifically, New Grenada, Venezuela, and Quito, Ecuador. I could take that whole thing out and read it and the sentence still makes sense. I could say, um, in addition to advocating for South America's independence and two political treatises, the Cartagena Manifesto and the letter from Jamaica, Simone Bolivar personally led armies against the Spanish, liberating three South American territories from colonial rule. See how I don't need that in there? It literally makes sense without it. So I'm going to go with D. All right, prediction number seven. I am predicting you're going to have a system of equations with binomials they're actually very easy. Just treat the binomial like it's a variable. So if they want the value of six times X minus two, I'm gonna actually get rid of the Y plus sevens. And I see that they already cancel out because I have negative four of them and positive four of them. So when I add these together, I have two X minus twos. And then I just have to add together 117 and 442. So I get 559. Now here's the thing. At this point, I don't want to divide by two because they actually want six of them. So I'm going to multiply both sides by three. And that'll tell me how many six are worth. Quick hack, you'll get the answer very, very easily and quickly. The answer is 1677. All right, my next prediction, prediction number eight, is that semicolons are going to separate items in a list. So Here's what I want you to look for. This is pretty simple. When you read the sentence, look down towards the end, because if you notice a semicolon with an and right after it, they are definitely using semicolons to separate items in a list. So at that point, just pick the semicolon and move on. All right, my ninth prediction is that they will have a question on margin of error. So the big thing to know with margin of error is if you want to decrease the margin of error, you need to increase the sample size. It's not um, improving the tool or any of the other trap answers they might give you. It's all about the sample size. So when they say, which of the following is the most appropriate reason that the margin of error for sample A is greater than the margin of error of sample B? Well, sample A had a larger sample size. Oh, wait, no, haha, -ha, they almost tricked me. If it's a margin of error is greater, it has a smaller sample size. Whew, so be careful, take an extra five or 10 seconds to process it because I almost got got on that problem. All right, my last and final prediction is that they will ask about the distinct solutions of a quadratic. Now, one thing to understand about distinct solutions of a quadratic is where the quadratic crosses the X axis and how many times. Um, now, you can use the discriminant, which is B squared minus 4AC, to figure that out. If it's positive, you'll have two solutions. If it's zero, you'll have one solution. If it's negative, you'll have zero solutions. But you can also um, take this equation and type it into Desmos. If they say there's two distinct real solutions, we're going to have a slider for M because that's our constant. And we're just gonna move it around until we have two distinct real solutions. So let me demonstrate. Did you see how when I just did that with an equal sign, it had an error message? When you put equal signs in for a quadratic, it's tricky, sometimes it won't work. Um, it forces Desmos to try to just find the solution, so you might see lines straight up and down instead of getting that nice parabolic shape. 
So what I'm going to do is if it equaled negative 10, I'm going to add it to the other side. So everything's on one line together. And then that way I can have a slider M. Let me zoom out. Beautiful. I can see my parabola. Now I'm going to move M around. And I'm going to check to see if they said if M was positive or negative. Okay. They said, what is the greatest possible value of M? So I'm getting as big as I can right now. And we still have two distinct solutions. Let's see if I can go even bigger. I'll change the, um, the interval. Wow. Okay. It looks like I'm still, I still have some room. So we'll go 50 to 60. And what I'm going to do is zoom in. And we still have some room. So I'm going to go 60 to 80. And as you can see at this point, it looks like it's not touching anymore and we want it to touch twice. So they said M is an integer. So it looks like our highest integer we can get for M where it's going to have two distinct solutions is at 62. All right, guys, that's it for this predictions video. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, type rock star in the comments below because you are an absolute rock star and I hope you smash this test this weekend. Please also comment below and let me know what you specifically will be studying and working towards this week. Are you going to work on math, English, uh, geometry and trig or algebra? What's your focus? What's your plan of attack? Until next time, guys, happy prepping.